All right, today we're going to be taking a look at the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be dealing with chapter 7. Hallelujah. You know, this is the way our scales should look. Now, unfortunately, you know, for many self-professed believers, the scales aren't tipped in this favor. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is today. You know, but this is the, this is the objective in our life, you know, is to have the tails, uh, scales tipped in the favor of the word of Elohim over that of the world. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a quote from William Blackstone. It says, no enactment of man can be considered law unless it conforms to the law of Elohim. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is so, so true. Actually, is actually the, one of the maxims in law. You know, so that's a little indicated by what we're going to get into a little bit in this chapter. But uh, let me have my first reader read Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, please. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, oft eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes said to him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Hallelujah. Okay, so here it is. We'll see verse 3 says, um, and well, verse two actually says uh, they found fault. They, no, you know, I want you to know and understand that the wicked will always try to find fault with the righteous. You know, and if they can't find something, oftentimes they'll make something up. You know, but the point being is that you know the wicked is always trying to find fault with the righteous. So know that once you put Yah's name upon you, they're looking. They're looking so that they can find fault. You know, once you declare that you stand for something other than, than they, what they stand for, they begin to watch more closely to try to find fault. And this was what, what they were doing with our Messiah, as we read in several places throughout the Brit Kadashah. You know, but what I want you to know is that the above is making reference to what's referred to as the Yahudim's Halakha. You know, Halakha is often translated as Jewish law, but it literally means the way that one walks, and it's, it was made reference to it by our Messiah when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That way that he was speaking about was the halakha, you know, the way one walks. Now, generally speaking, halakha refers to Torah and rabbinical law. You know, when the Yahudim, when they think of halakha, they think of the written law of Elohim and the rabbinical law, you know. Now, the difference is, you know, the thing is, is you know, they uphold the rabbinical law over the written law of Elohim, you know, and you know, but they do look at this halakha, you know, and and they they understand that it's re it's it tends it's supposed to represent a way of life. It is meant to be a comprehensive guide to walking through everyday life, you know. Now. Generally speaking, the Yahudim will put their rabbinical laws above Torah or the written word of Elohim. And that's important to understand, you know, when you're reading through the Brit Kadashah, see, because a lot of times, you know, references are made to the law and it's actually um, speaking of the rabbinical law, you know, but it doesn't say rabbinical law because in the, in the, in the uh, Yahudim's mind, there's no difference. It's all just the law. You know, so 
during that time, the rabbinical law was the law of land in conjunction with Torah. You know, but as aforementioned, they would uphold the rabbinical law over Torah or over the written word of Elohim. And it's real important to keep that in mind. So, our Messiah answers them in, in verses 6 through 8. He says, he answered and said unto them, Well say of Isaiah, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of Elohim, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things ye do. You know, so it's, it's important to under, understand that this prophecy that he's speaking of, you know, because in understanding this prophecy, you see what vein that he's coming out of, you know, uh, it speaks to the state that the Yahudim was in then, as well as now, as, you know, um, and many Christians um, are in even now. You know, for uh, many of them still look to the Yahudim for advice, especially, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sad to say, but especially those who are looking for truth, they tend to jump out the frying pan of Christendom and into the skillet of Judaism. You know, and they go from from being a Christian to being a Jew, and you don't really want to be neither one. You don't want to be in the frying pan nor the skillet. You want to be in the fire, because Yah is a consuming fire. So get out the frying pan and the skillet and jump into the fire and let Yah consume everything that is not of him. You know, now this prophecy that, that our Messiah was referencing is found in Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. As part of it, it says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. The book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. He said, Say, if I am not learned. Wherefore the Adonai says, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. You know, and, you know, this is an important concept to understand. You know, for, you know, Yah tells us that, you know, the vision of all that, that, become, that come to them is as the words of a book that is sealed. They, they can't understand it. You know, and it says, it's like when men deliver one that is learned and saying, read this, I pray, and he say, I can't, it's sealed. See, and you have to understand that that's how the scriptures are, you know, for the Yahudim, they're sealed. They can't understand it. You know, uh, and the reason being, one, a big part of the reason is because, of, you know, they have removed their hearts from Yah. And their fear for Elohim is taught by the precept of men. You know, so what he, what um, yes, Yahoo means by this is exactly what the Messiah is saying here in Mark, Mark 7. You know, he's saying, you know, they worship him in vain, you know, because, you know, they're, fe they, they're really fearing the teaching for, uh, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. That's what they're really fearing. They're fearing the commandments of men more so than they're fearing the commandments of Elohim. And so it was then, and so it is now today. They still fear the commandments of men over. They hold the uh, rabbinical law over the written word of Elohim. So that is fearing the commandments of men over the commandments of Elohim. You know, what is this seal? Why, why can't they, why can't they, um, they learn it, read it? It says for a seal, you know, um, 1 Corinthians 2.14, it teaches us, you know, how y'all sealed it, you know, and, uh, and we're going to get into more of why they can't read it, you know, but it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of, his, of the Ruach of Elohim. See, you have to understand that first the natural, then the spiritual, everything that was done, you know, in, in, uh, in Torah, the prophets and the writings was, was, was 
naturally was done naturally but the things that was done in the brick kind of shot by the messiah and the apostles were, were done spiritually of elohim you know and so here it is you have those because they they stumble at the stumbling um block which is yahushua they stumble at the stumbling stone which is yahushua you know they can't become spiritual you know they can't be father from above and become spiritual beings and therefore they can't understand the things that's in the spirit you know um for as first corinthians 2 14 says but the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of elohim for they are foolishness unto him see and this is the way that they felt about you know the sayings of yahshua and what yahshua was saying and doing when he walked the earth they thought it to be foolishness you know and and I tell you, even now today, when you go go about and you start teaching it, or, or you start even speaking and, and um, telling people about the things of Yahushua, you know, the spiritual things, they're going to look at you like you're foolish. They're gonna, it's going to be foolishness to them. You know, and, and this, is still, this still remains true today. It goes on to say, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So, you see, the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. Because they're spiritually um, discerned. So that what does that mean? That means you have to become spiritual. You have to become spiritual. You have to be father from above. Are you born again? This is why the Messiah says, except you be father from above or born again, you should by no means enter into the kingdom of Elohim. Well, it actually says you can't even see the kingdom. You know, you can't see it because your spiritual eyes won't be open. So you have to be father from above, i.e. born again, to become that spiritual being so that your spiritual eyes can be open so that you can even see the kingdom. Yeah. You know, that's why, the, you know, you, you go talking about the kingdom to the natural man today, you know, um, you know, a, a very large percentage of uh, uh, the quote-unquote Christians, you know, they they still waiting for the kingdom to come. They're, they're, you know, they don't believe the kingdom came. They don't believe the kingdom is open and, and, and available to, to be entered into. Even though the whole gospel was centered around the kingdom and its king. Even though scripture says that they was running in. Even though they um, our Messiah gave us the admonition to, to strive, to fight, to get into it. But it's foolishness to them. Because they're in the natural. Because they're currently minded. You know, so this thing is still going on, you know, and, and it's just like it was back then, you know, but it's it's become like that again. You know, uh, just as uh, Solomon taught in Ecclesiastes, you know, it's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's happened, will happen again. And that's exactly what's going on. It's happening again. You know, and so we shouldn't be caught unawares and we, you know, because we know everything that's going to happen. So that's why we're supposed to be the most mature group of believers that has, have ever lived. You know, that's why we're supposed to bring forth the sons of Elohim into the earth. You know, but I stray. Let me get back on, on topic. <laughs> Continuing on in Yochanan 653 through 63. My next reader, please. Then Yahushua said unto said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has said, has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. 
Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard, and hard saying. Who can hear it? When Yahushua knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Hallelujah. Okay, so here we have an example of a spiritual matter, you know, that... You know, even now today, you know, many people stumble at this saying. You know, even as, as we've seen in, in verse 60, um, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? You know, and many of them left them during this time. You know, see, you know, but he was speaking of the truth. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat. The flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And they're like, whoa, whoa, what did he just say? So he repeats it for them. Whoso eat of my flesh and drink of my blood have eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he says, so he that eat of me, even he shall live by me. This it's the bread which came down from heaven. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. You know, and they're just like taken aback, you know, and they're like, man, what is this guy talking about? He's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And are you serious? Who can hear this? You know? And so many of them left, see, because they were they were yet carnal minded. You know, and they didn't understand the spiritual uh, aspect of what he was speaking of. You know, and this is a big part of the problem today. People stumbled at this today, and you still hear people talking about this. Talking about, oh, the Messiah was talking, you know, he was, you know, he can't be the Messiah. He was talking about cannibalism, you know, and, um, and, and you know, and Yahuwah would never advocate that, and, you know, and they try to discredit him as being the Messiah because it seems to them as foolishness. You know, but it's even because they can't see it because they have no spiritual eyes. So they can't spiritually discern it. You know, the Messiah wasn't talking about eating this physical flesh and drinking this physical blood. You know, he was speaking spiritually. You know, and he gives he gives you the, the key to what he's what he's speaking about in verse um, 63. He tells you it is the spirit, it's the ruach that quicken up. That's where the life comes from. You know, it's the Ruach that brings the light. The flesh profit of nothing. This flesh don't profit anything. You know, it's just it's just a, a conduit, if you would. You know, it says, the words that I speak unto you, they are Ruach and they are life. See, this is that true bread. Even the words that he spoke, his commandments, his words, and his sayings. That's the true bread of life. That was his flesh. The words that he spoke via his flesh, his commandments, words, and sayings, that is the bread of life. That's the Ruach, and that is the life. See, and what he was saying is you have to eat those words, That mean, meaning you have to do those commandments, words, and sayings of Yahushua in order to obtain life. Wasn't talking about, you know, taking a... A, a steak knife and cutting off a slice of his flesh and and um, and eating it, you know, or 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 draining his blood and drinking it. No, you know, his blood that is drink speaks to his covenant, which he said, you know, this is my blood which is uh, spilled for you. It's shed, uh, spilled for you. This is um, the blood of my new covenant, you know, which is shed for you, you know. The blood speaks to his covenant. So he's talking about those who, who do his commandments, words, and sayings. Because, you know, even if you have the bread, which we all have the bread because we all have a Bible. So we all have the commandments, words, and sayings of Yahshua. But just having it isn't good enough. He didn't say, he who have my flesh. 
has eternal life, or he who has my flesh and has my, my uh, blood have eternal life. No, he says, he who so eateth my flesh. So to eat his words is to actually do his words. See, because when you eat, what you eat becomes a part of your flesh. So for you to eat the word of Elohim, that means it becomes a part of your flesh. It manifests in your flesh. So that means you do it. And in order to drink his blood, it speaks to you drinking of the blood of his covenant, which is a blood covenant, a lifelong covenant, even a covenant that exceeds um, um, life in our actuality. You know, so this is what he's talking about. You know, but those that are currently minded and that are um, in the natural, they won't be able to receive this. You know, even as they were, they weren't able to receive it then. You know, still they won't be able to receive it now. You know, and so this is um, the whole, all the words and sayings, you know, concerning the kingdom, concerning the gospel. This is why you don't hear of it anymore. Because don't no one understand it. They can't receive it. It's, it's as foolishness to them. They're like, where's the kingdom? I don't see it. Where is it? When does it come? You know, when he clearly told them, you know, it comes not without, it, it's, it doesn't come with observation. Neither will man say, you know, look here or look there. It doesn't come with observation. For the kingdom of Elohim is within you. See, these are spiritual things and they have to be discerned spiritually. Let me have my next reader read Matthew, Yahoo 7, 9 through 13, please. And he said unto them, Full well we reject the commandments of Elohim, that we may keep our own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father thy and thy mother, and whoso curses thy father and mother, let him tie the death. But he but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is that is to say a gift by whatever by whatsoever thou makest be profit by me he shall be free and ye shall suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother making the word of Elohim of none effect through our tradition which we have delivered and many such like things we do. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, so we see in verse 9, he tells them, Full well ye reject the commandment of Elohim, that ye may keep your own tradition. Full well. You know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you're looking for a way to get out of um, doing it. For Moshe said, now he said, for Moshe said, but, you know, where did Moshe get it from? He got it from Yahuwah, right? Yep. You know, um, and Yahuwah told him this himself, but, you know, they asked for him to stop talking. You know, say, no, nah, you know, well, we're we going to send we gonna send your servant Moshe up there. You tell him, and he'll tell us. Only you don't speak to us no more unless we die. <laughs> you know, and Yah said, hey, they spoke in well. See, because that's part of the plan. That's part of the plan. Your flesh need, needs to die. You know, your flesh needs to die in order for the for the Ruach to live. Your flesh needs to die. You know, so here it is. He says, for Moshe said, honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curse a father or mother, let him die to death. Right? That's what, that's what the word says. That's the word of Elohim. You know, but they said, it is Corbin. They said, but uh, he said, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father and mother, it is Corbin, that is to say a gift, and um, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. You know, now this was a major issue during the time of Messiah, uh, of the Messiah, and it, it's just as bad or worse today than it was back then in all actuality. For as aforementioned, the halakha of the Yahudim incorporate, incorporate both Yah's law and rabbinical laws. You know, which rabbinical laws is, of course, man's law. But today, most Yahudim and Christians alike only live by man's law alone and 
have totally neglected Yah's law as something secondary or even unnecessary. You know, uh, and this is what they were doing during this time. They were saying, okay, it's a Corban, it's a gift, so everything I, that I have, I've dedicated to, dedicated it to Yah as Corban, it's a gift, I'm just managing it. You know, and so in doing that, you know, they didn't have to um, honor their mother or father. You know, you see, so you see how they got got out from around that that commandment with the uh, commandment of men. You know, well, what does it mean? You know, I mean, you know, what does that have to do with honoring your mother or father anyway? You know, um, you know, that has nothing to do with being with honoring your mother or father. No, it doesn't. Not in the sense of honoring your mother, mother and father, um, that we have the under. In the sense of the understanding that we have today. Because in the sense of the understanding that we have today, honoring your mother and father just speaks to, you know, being respectful. You know, yes, yes, ma'am, no, sir, you know, uh, so on and so forth. You know, just being respectful and, and being, quote, unquote, honorable, right? But, you know, what y'all had in mind was something a, a bit different. You know, and the only way you're going to see it is if we look at the, um, the wording. So we look at the uh, word honor, we look at the original word honor from which the command came, and it's, we find that it's kabar. Number 3513, it means to be heavy. You know, like, okay, um, so, so technically it's saying, you know, honor your mother and father, make them heavy. That's what it's saying. It's saying, make them heavy. You know, and you're like, okay, uh, that, that's, that means nothing, right? You know, um, but if you understand that everything that was brought or sold during that time, as well as many things now today, you know, was purchased in accordance to weight. When you understand that all monies or currencies of the world is, um, well, not anymore, but the mass majority of them is in direct correlation to weight or weights, you know, then you begin to see it. You know, um, like, it's easy to see with the English money because the Eng English pound, you know, um, because we use pounds, you know, still in America. You know, we know a pound is a term of weight. You know, but some may not know that a dollar is also a term of weight. You know, a dollar is like 375.25 um, fine grains of silver constitutes a dollar, you know, somewhere around that. Um, but that constitutes a dollar. A dollar is a term of weight. You know, and the same thing with, um, with most other uh, 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 brands of money. You know, it speaks to different weights. So the more, the more of it you have, the heavier it is, the, the more wealthy you are. So if you have a whole lot of it, say like you had a whole lot of gold or silver, you know, it would be heavy, right? You know, and so... You know, that means you will value it more because the heavier it is, the more you value it because, you know, the more money you have. You know, so that's the idea behind honor your father and your mother is to make them valuable in your sight. Make them valuable to me. You know, and now if you were going through the wilderness and you, uh, you were on your way to, to the city, and you found this bag of gold, and this bag of gold was really heavy, you would struggle and strain and, and, and to, to get that bag of gold back to the city, right? Because no matter how heavy it was, you'll, you'll, you'll deal with that heaviness because of the value that you perceive that's in that gold and silver, right? Okay, well, that's the same way you're supposed to do with your mom and dad. You know, you're supposed to be pulling and, and pushing and doing whatever you have to do to get them to where they need to be because they're that valuable to you. Just like that bag of gold. Hence, when we see um, honor in the Brick Hadashah, it's tomorrow, number 5091, meaning to prize, to fix a valuation. So you see, you know, this idea also comes forth into the Greek, you know, um, the heavier something is, the more of a prize it is, the more uh, uh, valuable it is. And so this is what it scripturally means to honor your father and mother. It has nothing to do, um, well, it has something to do with being respectful, but, you know, you 
more so it speaks to making them valuable in your sight. So you're you're willing to do any and everything that is possible in order to honor them because they are that valuable to you. You know. And now, now contrary wise, it says who who so curse a father or mother, let him die to death. So let's take a look at, at curse. You know, um, well, the Greek word curse is kako, kakologeo. Yeah, kakologeo. All right, good enough. Number 2551 comes from kakos, meaning worthless, and from logos, meaning something said. You know, now the Hebrew uh, uh, word, oh, I forgot to put it down. Yeah, but it's number 743, 7043, and it means to make light. Um, I think it's, uh, and it almost came to me. Uh, curse, curse, curse. Kalal, Kalal, Q A Q A L. Uh, Q A L A W W L something like that. Kalal, um, number seven seven zero four three, and it means to make light. So you see, it's just the opposite of kabod, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> which means to make heavy, you know. And so, it, and it means just the opposite, you know. If you curse them, see, you you thinking, well, I don't curse my mother or father, but yes, if you devalue them in any type of way, if you make make them light or less valuable in any type of way, you're actually cursing them, scripturally speaking. So you have to understand that. You know, because, you know, you may be thinking like, well, you know, no, I, you know, I, don't, I don't curse at my parents. You know, no. You need to understand it from the scriptural viewpoint because that's what you're going to be judged in accordance to. You know, what Yah said, not what man said that Yah said. Amen? You know, so... To make them light in any type of way is to curse them. You know, so we want to we want to make them heavy. We want to make them valuable in our lives. We want to prize them. We want to fix a high valuation upon their existence. You know, and we want to treat them accordingly. We don't want to make light of them. We don't, we don't want to say anything against them that's going to make them, you know, worth less than what what they should be. Value that. All right. Everybody got that one. All right. Uh, you know, now, as I was saying um, previously, you know, this is a major issue now today, this, this thing of, you know, holding on to man's law and, and, and neglecting Yah's law. You know, now, we, some examples today could include murder, you know, where Yah says, thou shalt not murder, right? You know, that's against Yah's law, that's against Torah, but man's law says it's okay if one does it for a governmental entity. You know, they send men out to go murder other, other people all the time. You know, um, and they say it's, well, it's under the guise of this or the guise of that, but, you know, at the end of the day, murder is murder. You know, um, again, Yah's law says that thou should not steal. But man's law today says it's okay. As long as you're employed by a governmental entity. <laughs> yeah, really. Hmm. You know, you know, if if you look at uh at today's forfeiture laws, you know, it's nothing but modern day theft. You know, no one has to be, you know, and you have to understand a little bit about law to understand where I'm coming from. You know, um, in law. You know, if there's not a damaged party, then, you know, there's no law that has been broken. You know, if no one has damaged or um, uh, anyone else's uh, life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness, then there's no, there's no um, law that's been broken. It's kind of like no harm, no foul. You know, there has to be a damaged party. You know, but now today, it don't have to be no damage party. You know, hey, come in, we'll take everything you have. <clears throat> well, well, why? Just because we want to, because we're, we're the IRS, you know, or, you know, or we're, we're the Detroit Police Department, or, you know, we're the federal government, or we're the state government. You know, we can come in and take what we want. You know, 
But really what that is, is, you know, commandments of men that's being exalted over the commandments of Elohim. You know, they just pull the wool over your eyes so that you don't see it. You know, again, Yah's law says, let every matter be established by two to three witnesses. But man's law say, oh, that's not necessary. You know, I didn't see this man. Nope, we have no witnesses of this man uh, doing any wrongdoing. You know, all we have is a bunch of hearsay. But we have no, no witnesses. We don't really have any, any sure evidence. But we're going to, you know, lock them up and throw away the key anyway. Or we're going to send them to the death chamber. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, I bring these out because I want you to be able to see that, it's, that today is no different than, than in Yahshua's days. It's no different. You know, again, like uh, uh, Solomon said, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything's happening over again. Now, you know, they, men still exalt their laws over Yah's, even though you read in places like Psalms 119.89, it says, Forever, O Yahuwah, thy word is settled in heaven. How long is forever? Hmm. You know, his word is settled in heaven. Psalms 119.142, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. When did it stop becoming, a, uh, when did it stop being the truth? You know, and, and if it is the truth, then what about those laws that contradict it? Are they lies? Hmm. Say a lie. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Anybody want a recipe for success? Here you go. Hallelujah. Yeah, this is the true prosperity message right here. The book of the law, the book of Torah, shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest observe, do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy, thy way prosperous. How's that for prosperity? And then thou shalt have good success. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to Yahuwah, our Elohim, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this Torah or this law. Yeah, even though it says that, but they still find a way to exalt their, their own thing over it. Psalms 119, 44, so shall I keep thy law, how long? Continually, how long? Forever, and when? And ever. So shall I keep thy Torah continually forever and ever. Last I checked, you know, one of them average men went by, but the last one sure happened. <laughs> you know, Yochanan 1, 3, 4 through 6, you know, and see, and this is, the, this is really the, uh, the crux of the matter. You know, 1 John 3, 4 through 6 says, whosoever commit a sin transgresseth also the law. See, now, it just doesn't make sense to me. You have, you have these, these people... These, these leaders of all, of all people, I can see why Yah's judgment is going to begin, you know, with the leadership. You know, you have these leaders that says it's okay to transgress the law. You know, when the very same scriptures, um, even in the Brick Kadashah says, whosoever commit a sin transgresseth also the law. So if you tell them that it's okay to transgress the law, you tell them it's okay to sin. Because it, it also says for sin is the transgression of the law. This is the definition of sin in accordance to the word of Elohim. There it is. Right. I don't care what man say. This is what the word of Elohim says. It says, for sin is the transgression of Torah. And when you tell a person that they don't have to do Torah, you're telling them it's okay to sin, and it is not. It goes on to say, and ye know that he, speaking of our Messiah, was manifested to take away our sins. He was manifested to take away our transgressions of Torah. And in him is no sin. In him is no transgression of Torah. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. So whoso abideth in Yahushua does not transgress Torah. 
Whoso sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. Whoso transgressed Torah have not seen him, neither known him. You have to get that. You know, now you don't have it up there, but first Job 9, 3, 7, the very next verse says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Our Messiah came and he did righteousness. That's why he was righteous. Not because he spoke righteously, but because he done righteousness. You know, and if we want to be righteous, we have to do righteousness as well. We can't do sin and then think that we're righteous because he was righteous. And that's what people teach. And that's just preposterous. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you're not uh, righteous because he was righteous. You're righteous when you've done what he did. Mm -hmm. He came to show us the way. So that you can pick up your torture stake and follow him like he picked up his for your behalf. Okay, let me get off that soul. Let me have my next reader read Mark 7, 14 through 23, please. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If a man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he has entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enters into the man, it cannot defile him, because it enters not into his heart, but into the belly, and goes out into the drop, purging all meats. And he said, that which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Hallelujah. You know, now again, Yahushua is speaking spiritually. You know, but some people that are carnal minded, they look at this and they say, see, we can have swine or whatever we want. We, we, can, we can eat whatever we like. You know? You know, and they just misunderstand the point that our Messiah is making. He says, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. He wants us to understand this. There is nothing without man that entering into him can defile him. He's speaking about the spiritual man. He's not talking about the, the, um, the physical man or the natural man. You know, for Torah, Scripture teaches, you know, that the, the natural man that eateth um, the unclean things, that it will be an abomination unto his flesh. It specifically says that it will be an abomination to his flesh. No, it's not going to bother the spirit man. You know, but if you don't want to be sick, you know, while you're living your spiritual existence in this flesh body, then I would advise you not to defile your flesh. You know, and seeing that your fleshly temple is, the, um, your fleshly, fleshly body, your flesh body is the temple of Elohim, and you want Yah to dwell there, then you need to keep it clean. Amen? You know, but as far as the spirit man is concerned, that which come up out of the flesh man that the, um, is is what defiles the spirit man. It's it's those evil thoughts that you have to bring into subjection to the word of Elohim. It's those adulteries that you that you have to abstain from doing, and the fornications, and the murders, and the thefts, and the co um, covetousness, and the wickedness, and the deceit, and the lasciviousness, and the evil eye, and all these things. This the pride, the foolishness, the blasphemy. This is, these things that come out of the heart is what defile of that spiritual man, you know. So we definitely want to, we want to keep the physical man clean, but we definitely want to keep the spiritual man clean even more so. Amen. Amen.
and we have uh, Mark 7, 45 through 26. Um, it says, and from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a an house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain man whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Okay? So now this is the story of uh, uh, this, this, uh, this Gentile woman, if you would, that was coming to our Messiah and was trying to get, you know, um, have favor, you know, from him. You know, and so it speaks of, of him arising and him going into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and he entered into a house and he was trying to stay, keep it on the low. You know, but this woman was keeping up a ruckus. You know, um, her daughter had an unclean spirit and she, she was uh, beseeching, she was beseeching our uh, Messiah to get rid of it. You know, now it says the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. But we have the same story that occurs again in Matthew Yahoo 15, 21 through 24. And it gives us some more details to the story. See, and this is why when you're dealing with a story that, that um, occurs more than once, you, you, you have to look at all occurrences so that you can get all the details. You know, it says, Then Yahushua went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. See, going to the same place. And behold, a woman of Canaan. Now, you know, on the surface this may look like a contradiction, but it isn't. Canaan is just simply the land like we were um, speaking about the land of Canaan, you know, and within the land of Canaan, you had different nations. Remember, um, Israel was sent into the land of Canaan, and it was like seven different nations that was dwelling there that they had to deal with. Okay, this is no different. You know, this particular woman, she was in the land of Canaan, but she was a Syrophoenician by nation, you know, and she was a Greek. Okay? So, now, it says, uh, she came out of the same coast and cried unto him, have mercy on me, O Adonai. You know, um, so, have mercy on me, O Adonai, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. You know, so now, uh, here in Mark, we just told that uh, a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. You know, and, you know, uh, he, she was asking him that he would cast the devil out of her daughter. Now, it says, uh, and verse 22 or 23 says but he answered her not a word here it is she was beseeching him and he, was, he wasn't even answering her he wasn't saying anything you know and it says his disciples came and besought him saying send her away she crying after us you know we trying to keep keep a low profile here and here it is she <laughs> crying behind us you know send her away you know and uh, I really do believe that Yah was actually <laughs> waiting on them to say something, you know, because that's when he answered. He said, uh, uh, he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he, he answers her and he tells her that he's only sent to the lost sheep of Israel, you know. But this woman is persistent, you know, and this is the way we have to be when we're petitioning Yah, especially when it's something important to us. We have to be persistent, you know. Um, verse uh, Matthew 15, 25 and 26 teaches it says then came she and worshipped him you know so let's uh, take note first of all she uh, she came to him calling him Adonai or Lord you know and letting him know that she knows exactly who he is and she believes that he is the son of Dabi the rightful heir to the throne the Mashiach that you know the land of Israel uh, all those of Israel have been waiting for you know, so she's letting them know, look, I know who you are, you know, and I know you can do this, you know, and I need you to do this for me. But he wasn't answering, you know, and when he did answer, he said, look, look, okay, I see you know who I am, you know, but I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of Israel, you know. But then it says she came and worshipped him, saying, Adonai, help me, you know, so now she's worshipping him. She's saying, okay, okay, I, uh, um. You know, I know who you are. I know you're the son of Elohim. You know, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you. Help me. Okay, now I'm worshiping you. You're my Adonai. Help me. But he answered and said, it is not me.
to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. You know, now, let us contemplate this for a second. What does he mean by the children's bread? You know, we just um, went over this, you know, uh, when he was telling, in Yoga 9, 6, when he was telling them they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. You know, he's talking about himself, you know, the things that he do in the flesh. His fleshly existence upon the earth, you know, was to give the commandments, words, and sayings of Elohim unto the children of Israel, you know, and they were to benefit, you know, from the miracle signs and wonders that bore witness to what the words, commandments, words, and sayings that he was saying being truly the words of Elohim, you know, and so he's like, okay, you know, I, 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 got, a, I got a mission here, you know, it's not me for me to take the children of bread and cast it to the dogs, you know, uh, and in verse 27 of Mark 7, he says, but Yah it says, but Yahushua said unto her, let the little, let the children first be filled. So he didn't totally disregard her, you know. He just said, let the children first be filled. It's not me that I take the children bread and cast it to the dog. Let the children first be filled. You know, they, they got to come first. For it is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dog. So now we get a fuller understanding of what was being said. So he wasn't just flat out, you know, um, turning her down. He was just saying, you know, look, you know, I, I got to do what I got to do first, you know, and then, you know, after I, I feed the children first, you know, then, then, then I deal with the dogs, <laughs> you know. And, but her answer was phenomenal, yes. you know. In verse twenty-eight, it says, and she answered and said unto him, Yes, Adonai. Yes, that's right. You're absolutely correct. The children ought to come first. Yet, the dogs under the table. Eat the oh, yeah. children's crumbs. Yeah. You know, and our Messiah in verse 29 it says, and he said unto her, For this same, for this same, go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy door. Hmm. And when she came to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Hmm. So what was so special about that same? You know, because you know, you have to put it in conjunction with everything else. You know, first of all, she recognized who he was, that he was the son of Elohim, that he was uh, the son of uh, David, the rightful heir to the throne. And she called him Adonai, saying that, you know, you're my Adonai. You know, she worshipped him, saying, you know, you're my, you're my, you're my master. I'm going to worship you. And she says the dogs under the table, thereby making herself his dog. See, because you don't have a strange dog up under your table, I mean, you know, with your kids while they're eating at the table. You don't have a strange dog, strange dogs under the table, right? You know, you have your pets up under the table, your dogs. And so she's saying, yeah, I may be a dog, but I'm your dog. <laughs> I'm your dog, and I'm hungry. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So he gave her a crumb, and her daughter was healed. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture, you know, and, and it's a beautiful picture of how it was always meant for the Gentiles to come in, you know, but there's an order, everything in decency and in order, there was an order that had to be, that had to be uh, 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 first, you know, and truly, it was just a crumb, because you don't hear about him doing this for, um, for, for any Gentiles, you know, not very many. It's only like a couple in all in, in all of the brick kind of shop. You know, and 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 I think it's two, and both of them. You know, it speaks of them having great faith, not just strong faith, but great faith. And this woman had great faith. You know, and so it was allowed her. She she got some crumbs. You know, and her daughter was free from from that uh, <coughs> devil that vexed her. You know, that's a Beautiful, beautiful picture there. You know, um, let me have my next reader read Mark 7, 31 through 37. Um, 31 to the end of the chapter, please. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and, says, 
and said unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it, and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Hallelujah. You know, so they brought him a deaf man, had an impediment with his speech, you know. Uh -huh. And it speaks of him putting his fingers into his ears. You know, the uh, word finger in the, in the Hebrew is atzba, number 676. You know, it's a finger in the sense of grasping. And that's what he was putting in his ears. He was, he was putting the ability to grasp his commandments, words, and sayings. You know, so he didn't just open up the man's ears. He also opened up his sense of grasping, you know, understanding what, uh, what was coming out of his mouth, what he was saying. You know, and it says that he spit and touched his tongue. You know, and, and you know, first thing that, you know, may come to our mind is like, ooh, <laughs> what the heck? You know, but, you know, you, ha we have to, you have to be able to see the spiritual um, significance. You know, he was actually giving him um, living water. You know, Proverbs 10, 11 uh, tells us the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life but violence cover of the mouth of the wicked. And we also know that when he was at the well, with the woman at the well, he told her, you know, <coughs> if you'd have known who, who you had spoken to, you would ask for, um, for this living water so that you'll never have to thirst again. You know, uh, he, this is a spiritual significance of him giving this guy this living water, you know, and giving him the ability to grasp his, his commandments, words, and sayings. You know, uh, so he was really opening up his spiritual ears, you know, um, for him to receive his word, you know, just as well as he was opening up his physical ears, you know. And, of course, it says straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loose. Now, earlier in the chapter, that is in verse 6, Yahushua referenced a prophecy from, from Yeshayahu 29. Mm -hmm. And it seems that this event also could speak to that prophecy as well. You know, when we take a look at it in verse yes, Yahoo 29, 8 through 10, it says, It shall be as when an hungry man dreameth. Behold, he eateth, but he, he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and when he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Now, I want you to understand that we're supposed to be Mount Zion. You know, and this is, talk, this is speaking about us. You know, this is how it's going to be for those who come against us. And, and you need to understand this because it's, it's really important that you understand this. You know, because he says it shall be as when a hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or a thirsty man dreaming that he's drinking, but he awakened, he's still thirsty, and his soul still have appetite. So in other words, what he's saying is that it's going to look like they're winning. You know, it's going to look like the multitude of nations that fight against Mount Zion, the nation of Zion, it's going to look like they're winning. But when they wake up to, to the reality of, of the thing, they're going to find out that they lost. See, this is, this is what the prophet is being told. This, and we need to understand this because when it looked like we're getting whooped, when it looked like we're losing, we have to understand that this prophecy must come to pass. Is That's just how it's supposed to look. Nevertheless, we shall have victory in Yahshua. You know, so it goes on to say, stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. And you have to understand stand this. Verse 10 says, For Yahuwah hath poured out upon you the ruach of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. You know, and this spirit of slumber is still prevalent now today. And I want you to know and understand this. You know, and I, and, and I, I always tell this to, uh, to new recruits, you know, to uh, people who who just start um, trying to walk this way or just trying to trying to follow Yah, and I always give them a warning concerning 
this Ruach concerning this spirit of slumber. You know, and I tell them, I say, okay, now this is what I want you to do. First, first step you want to seek Yah, the first thing that you need to do is read his word. That's the first thing you need to do so that you, you know, because uh, our Messiah is the word. You know, so you need to read his word first and foremost, okay? So I tell them to commit to reading his word. You know, and then I, I give them a, a warning. I say, but I, I warn you, there's a spirit of slumber that, that guards that word. And whenever you start to try to commit to reading his word in, in the beginning stages, you know, and I don't really know of an individual that it hasn't happened to, you know, um, I'm not going to say that it's pro that there is no one that it has not happened to, but I don't know of any, you know. But when you first start reading the word, I don't care if you just woke up, it's the middle of the day, or it's late at night. Once you start saying, okay, I'm going to read during this time, you start reading, it looked like, you know, Two little guys is just hanging from your um, eyelids, you know, just forcing them to to, um, to close. You know, that's that ruach of sleep comes over so strong, you know, and I've seen it time and time again, and I uh, I dealt with it myself. You know, when when I first uh, began to study Yah's word, when I first was began to um, seek after Him, you know, I had to defeat this spirit, and, and anyone who is seeking Yah will have to overcome this spirit. Now, I can tell you how I overcame it. You know, it may help help you overcome it, um, or you may find a, a better way or a different way, but I can only tell you what worked for me. I had to stand up and walk and read it out loud. Mm. That was the only way I could get past that spirit of slumber. I had to literally stand and walk and read all at the same time. That's the only thing that, um, way I was able to overcome that spirit of slumber. But once <coughs> once I overcame it, then I didn't have that problem anymore. Mm. You know, and yeah. and it's it's usually the same with everyone else that I, I conferred with. You know, once you overcome it, you know, and you stay consistent, you don't have that problem now. If you if you uh, fall off, you know, the spirit comes back. Mm. You know. Uh, you fall off and you, you, you stay away from uh, from getting in his word for a while. You'll find out, you know, when you start trying again, oh, there it is again, you know. You know, so now I know what it is, so I just rebuke it, you know, um, you know, and uh, and keep it moving. You know, I don't really deal with him too much anymore. You know, uh, every blue moon he may try to come, you know, and I just rebuke it and keep on, keep on, and I'm good. You know, but I say that to say, it does exist, even now today. You know, and you're reading about it right here. You know, uh, yes, Yahoo 29, 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. I want you to know that Yah is doing a marvelous work and a wonder. It says, For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You know, we have... Uh, Folks that go to college and <coughs> and um, institutions of higher learning that teach contradictions mm -hmm. against the word of Elohim, but I want you to know and understand: the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, mm -hmm. and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You know, Yah's word is truth. You know, and it doesn't matter if you don't understand, you know, um, the, the truth of it, or you don't understand how it's true. You know that it's true. You know, 29.17 says, Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and a fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and a fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. Lebanon speaks to a mountain, Mount Lebanon. You know, and it speaks, it's saying it's going to be turned into a fruitful field, and, and that fruitful field will be esteemed as a forest, meaning a, a, a very dense place. You know, in verse 18, and in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the book. And the eyes of the blind shall see our out of obscurity and out of darkness, you know, and me being, being before you, 
you know, is proof that this this passage is being fulfilled in, in today's time. Because there wasn't anyone as deaf as I was and as blind as I was and in as deep a darkness as I was. You know, um, I couldn't hear, I couldn't see, and I was in darkness. And the sad part about it, I'm sad to say, I was pretty content with it. You know, but yeah. But yeah. He began to call me pull me out of that situation and the rest is history as they say you know but he says in Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field you know, so that you can have a perspective who has the other life you know so, so that you can have a perspective of what Mount Lebanon looked like. This is Mount Lebanon. You know, he says that Lebanon will become a fruitful field. That'd be pretty hard to make a fruitful field, wouldn't it? You know, and the thing about Lebanon is because of the snow always been on top of it, you know, it became a symbol of righteousness. You know, see, but this is like those righteous ones that live during the time of Messiah, that same as um, many of the righteous that live during our time. Yes, they on, on the outside they look righteous, but they're cold. Their love has waxed cold. There's no, there's no life. Very, as you can see, there's very little life on here. You know, yeah, it looks righteous. You know, it's nice and white, but no life you know and so he says this marvelous work that he's going to do it's going to be a marvelous work in the wonder he said that Lebanon should be turned to a fruitful field and it's going to be esteemed as a forest so he's saying it's going to be like a fruitful field this is a, a, a orange orchid you know this is truly a fruitful field that's like a forest and he said and he's going to turn this you know, these whitewashed sepulchers that's full of dead men's bones, that's dead, that looks righteous on the outside, but is dead inside. There's nothing living in this nation. He says he's going to turn that into this. Something that's full of life and bearing fruit. Fruit of love. Not of oranges, but of love, of joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, goodness, you know, um, kindness and faith and the things in which there is no law. This is what he's going to do, you know. So, hallelujah. That's all I have for you today.